you know, I'd never even been on a downhill mountain bike track. I was like 12 or 13. I entered myself into the Oceania Championships, right? So New Zealand, Australia, and the Pacific. I got to this downhill course. I, I had totally defied what I expected. I think the average time to get to the bottom took four minutes. It took me 24. I got to the bottom with dislocated fingers and a snapped leg. And that's always the way that I've approached things, is like take on the hardest thing first and figure out what it is actually going to take to get good at it instead of the smaller approach to things of putting, you know, testing the waters. I don't like testing the waters. Just Mm. jump right in. Mike. Hello, awesome people of the world, and welcome to another episode of Awesomeness with Cam Calcoon, where I have the privilege of sharing time with people, awesome people from New Zealand and around the world who dream big and achieve more. In this episode, we have my good friend Liam Malone, who came into the mind of as always a Paralympian. He went out there and smashed records. He then went to work in AI became a comedian, a personality that can inspire, motivate, and entertain on the biggest scale. If this guy thinks it, he gives it a go. And in doing so, creates many gems that he now shares with the world, and today, us. In this episode, we speak about many things, including change, enhancing skills, dealing with grief, how do we wish to spend our time responding to perceptions, building your team, personal responsibility. Basically, a collective of awesomeness for you to enjoy and maybe even embrace. Remember team, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. That's Liam, that's you, that's everyone. So dream big, achieve more, and enjoy the awesomeness. What's been going on, man? Oh boy, a lot of change happening in my life. So I recently left my job working at Soul Machines, which is a, a high-tech AI company based here in New Zealand, okay. uh, to pursue comedy. Uh, and that's been a disaster. And so... Why is that? What? The um, leaving the job so you think, or pursuing so, so comedy? How often would you tell jokes when you go and speak? You're a funny guy, and I've heard you speak before, and you can you can destroy a crowd and make them almost cry with laughter so i know you tell jokes yeah taking that and then taking that into a comedy club you'd think it would just transfer in a way yeah totally it it doesn't (laughs) and i don't know why and i haven't figured it out yet but my experience of comedy so far has been going into a bar where there might be five other people who didn't know that there was any comedy on i tell my five minutes worth of jokes i get no laughs I go home, I cry myself to sleep, and then I go and do it the next night. That's my experience of comedy so far. What? How come they don't know there's comedy? Is it because when you're getting started, you just go into a random bar? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, people run these open mic nights, so you're trying to get as much practice as possible. It's the same with speaking, right? You, yep. When people see a good speaker like yourself, I think a lot of people think you're innately talented, to which a degree you are, but to a greater degree, it's just practice makes perfect, Absolutely. right? And it's a massive grind. So the same thing is applied to comedy. There's people there that aren't that funny naturally, but are hilarious comics just because they work so hard at it. So when you're starting out, you it, it's really hard to get into the good comedy clubs because there's so many people trying to do it. And then you essentially just have to go to these bars where other comics run comedy shows and no one else is there to see comedy. And it's a horrible, okay. horrible time. Okay, but adversity and challenge isn't something that's new to you. So it's not, but I've had enough of it. Oh, but in this particular <laughs> No, 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 area? no, no, no. I'm joking. I've just had it I've just had enough adversity and challenge in my life. I'd love a little bit of an easy start with something. It's just not the case. So are you gonna Pursue with the comedy? Or? Oh, yeah. I'm not going to give yeah. up. No, yeah. no, no way. So you're just seeing it as being one of those other, I've got to get through it, and I've got yeah. to remember what's got me through it in the past. Absolutely. So, like, if you take the principles that got me through running and got me to the top in running, I think if you can apply, I can apply those to comedy. I should, I, I'm not, I have no 
really massive expectations on what might happen. So it's really one big experiment where I see what happens by applying those same principles to comedy and hopefully something cool happens as a result of it. Okay. And if not, it's going to be a hilarious story for my friends to laugh at me with in the pub. But do you think things should lead on from one to the other? Like, when you were doing the athletics, how did the comedy then come about? Like, had it always been there as a goal? So, did... no, 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 no. So comedy for me has always been a tool for hardship or getting through hardship, right? And there's been... I've not... Since I was a child and having two artificial legs and having a disability... I've never known any other way to get through hardship than just laughing about it. Same thing when my mum was dying of cancer, right? Like, when I found out that my mum was dying for cancer, was going to die, I came home from school, I read a letter from a surgeon who said her cancer had metastasized the rest of her body, and she saw me reading it, and she said, I'm going to die, but so are you. So, you know, which wasn't the thing that I wanted to hear, but it was a joke that at least lightened the situation. Yeah. Because we are all going to die. Now, I just have taken that through life, and comedy's been incredibly important to me, so why not go and do it? And I've had the exposure of speaking, as have you, and there's nothing better than getting a laugh during a talk. Absolutely. Yeah? That, that's well probably... That, feel that's, good. You're making people feel good. And in a time where machines are becoming really, really intelligent, and the... A lot of roles are going to be automated and made irrelevant in the near term and long term. Why not project forward and look back and go, what would I just wish I spent my time doing? So I was like, <coughs> I'm going to go do comedy and hopefully media stuff. Awesome. And here we are. And here we are. And when you make people feel good, it's a great segue into inspiration as well because you feed them all up. You know, you give them thinking about what is possible. You keep them relaxed, and when you can take them on to that, and now what are you going to do? Yeah, absolutely. Because when you heard about your your mum, how old were you, and at, at what stage in your life were you? Were you being the athlete that everyone knows? Or? No, no, no. So when she was first diagnosed with yep. cancer, I was 12, and then she went into remission perhaps uh, twice where she was cleared with cancer, or three times. I can't quite remember. And then the last time it came back, it had come back for good and the cancer had won. And I was 18 when I, uh, 17 when I read that letter from the, from the specialist or surgeon. And is that when you were away in Wellington with your mates? No, no, no. So oh. I was still in Nelson at high school at that point in time. Okay. Um, and uh, when she died, I was on a trip to Wellington with some friends. Okay, right, yeah. And I didn't tell any of them because I didn't want to ruin their weekend. Um, but that's life and people are going to die and people are going to die from cancer and I think there's something that's funny in people dying from cancer if you can make it funny and I think that is a way to heal very, very sore wounds. And do you feel that you have a licence when it comes to comedy that other people... I don't believe in licences, Cam. People say that you should only punch up I think you can punch up, you can punch down, you can punch wherever you want. I'm not, I, I don't buy into the whole, like if people, people make jokes about, loads of comics make jokes about disability. Yep. Who don't have disabilities. Yep. And I'm there laughing away, I can barely control yep. myself. People come to me afterwards who I might have gone to that show with being like, well that was inappropriate. I go, shut up. I'm like, what? they're almost trying to defend me on how I might feel in relation yeah. to that joke. Where do you and they, think that comes from? It's just a crazy time. I think it's just so prevalent amongst our generation, or at least, you know, a younger generation where sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me doesn't apply. I mean, people are just so offended and hurt by words now. I, 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 have I, you ever been offended or hurt by words growing up? Because you could have been a victim of that. Oh, yeah. Um... Yeah, I have been offended at times in the past. That's life, you know? Yeah. And if you don't have the emotional discipline to get over that, then you're done. Because at any point in time, you're going to play the victim card when something doesn't go your way. And that's a mug's game. You can't get through anything hard 
being offended that things didn't go your way or that someone said a word, said a sound, and you got upset about it. I, I just, I don't buy into that. Yeah. 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 And most of what I love about you, and is that something that's been embedded in you since you were born? Like, is it for your mum and dad? or? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough question of nature versus nurture. I think it's yeah. probably part genetic. Um, and this, you would have seen it with people that have disabilities. You, you, with, or with any life event, you can have someone that will have something go wrong in their life. And that will be them done for life, and they'll moan about it for life. Or... In my case, I've met so many people who have lost limbs at 20 or 30 and gone, oh, thank God I didn't die. Yep. I'm now going to go live life to the fullest. So I think it's part genetic, part the way I was brought up. I mean, my parents were absolutely horrific in making me do sports as a child. I mean, I came last and everything. I sucked at everything as a child, right? I mean, I would go and play cricket and get out LBW and... You know, our coach would debate whether or not a kid with no legs yeah. can get out leg before wicket <laughs> or are uh, both batsmen out because they've hit an extra stump. You know, yeah. it's like, and so um, I think my exposure to failure and hardship from a very young age just made me resilient. And it made me realise that the world is just, it's not equal and it's not fair. And that's by most parts a good thing. And your role as an individual, is to find out what you can be good at and not to find yourself by what other people are good at in relation to you. And when you find that thing that you can become good at, you can exceed expectations and you can see that I've heard you speaking about your artificial legs as creating an amazing, incredible opportunity and we saw that with the Paralympics. How did the, the Paralympic goal come about for you? Yeah, I drunk drove, um, so after my mum died, I went off went off a bit of a ledge. So I was on the benefit. Um, I was on the benefit. I, I should probably give a little bit of backstory and detail. Yeah, so that's cool. struggled struggled to get a job through high school, and then sold weed at sixteen, and then on the benefit at eighteen, got into the University of Canterbury only because the Christchurch earthquakes happened, and then. Um, I drunk drove in my first year of university. Well, as in because no one was wanting to go to Canterbury? Yeah, so they had a ton of money from the government to get new students to go. Okay. And I I scraped in. Yep. And then I drunk drove in the first few months of university, rung my friends that night, told them I was moving to Russia in the morning. I woke up, and fortunately those great friends of mine had called my dad, and he was already aware of what had happened, and perhaps that I was going to fly to Russia, and he... I guess, staged an intervention, for lack of a better word. And from there, I basically was like, well, I have had bad things happen to me, but I have to be responsible for how I react to everything that occurs. And I basically was, my dad was driving me back down to university um, in Christchurch, and I was just thinking in my head, like, what can I do, what can I do, what can I do? And then I brainstormed with a bunch of friends on different things I could do alongside university, and when you measure it against things like um, what do I have a high probability of success in? How can I escape competition? How can I create value at scale? Uh, and what will lead to compounding opportunities? Going and doing things like climbing Mount Cook didn't really match up against you know, going to the Paralympics. Okay. And at this point, I hadn't run in six years. I hadn't you know, worn shorts in seven years or something. And uh, it because was, you're not wanting to show your legs, your legs. yeah, I was really anxious, anxious at that point in time. Okay. Um, and again, no one else cared, but it was all in my head, you know. Yep. And that's for the individual to overcome. So yeah, at 19, I decided in three years' time I'd go to the Paralympics and win. And you did that. And I did, yeah. And it was a very tough journey, and there was no and obvious, I think, markers to suggest that I was going to win. Probably when I met Morty, who's yep, a really good coach. friend of yours, yep, and a friend of mine, and just a fantastic human being, and a beast of an athlete himself and coach. Really, I mean, he really he helped me drop two seconds within nine months. Yeah, I mean, so he's Which got he's got incredible. something. Spe- I mean, he's got something special going on, and he basically had to just get me to train less and less. I was just burning myself out, mm. and uh, yeah, and then I made it. And you got there in three years. So for them three years, you went from 
Steiner, a bit of a drag, uh, uh, a drunk party yeah, guy. Yeah, I, I was like to that. To an elite athlete. That's right. S- some people spend a lifetime to become that elite athlete. Sure. Yes, exactly. And so that's why part of me, what happened was, after the Paralympics, um, and I guess I should note that I went to the Paralympics as a blade runner, as a sprinter. Yeah. They changed the rules around the blades. And so when that happened, I was rather accepting that I could just move away knowing that I'd already achieved. They changed the rules after Rio. Rio. Yeah. Correct. And so, and plus I was beginning to get injured. And the world, there's just so many exciting things to do. Yeah. So I thought, okay, well, um, you can change the rules, which don't, didn't even make sense. I'm going to go do other things. Yeah. And that's life. And was that other thing ever to just, this hero just can become the fastest human ever because you would have had so much support as I said like getting to that level is the pinnacle for so, so many people you know to to then move on from that before you moved on were you thinking what else could I do with yeah this absolutely sport? so up until they changed the rules which came in about a year and a bit after Rio sorry two years after Rio and I've been injured during that time if I, I was tracking how fast I was progressing each year so I think I started out, I could run a, run the 100 in about 14 seconds. Okay. And within three years, I got down to 10.9. Yeah. In really bad environmental conditions where I hadn't slept. Um, I was stressed. I was still studying. This is it. Because of everything that's going on in your life. Right? Like, yeah, and just I did right. not enjoy the Rio Olympic Village. It okay. was, a, a t- a t- it was a, a budget hotel. Um, and so... I was like looking forward, right? Extrapolating how fast I could go. With some improvements in technology, I was like, ah, I might as well have a crack at just becoming the fastest person ever. ever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why not do that? Yeah. You know? I mean, Oscar got to the able bodied uh, Olympics, yep. or the Olympics. The fastest time over 100 meters on blades was you know, 0.6 behind Usain by okay. a Brazilian fellow who I bet at Rio. And I thought, well, there's just got to be something that could be done. So, yeah, began doing that sort of about eight months going down that path before the rule change. I was going to do that coincidingly with the Paralympics. And then the Paralympics changed the rules. I was going to lose my funding because I, I knew that I wouldn't be able to compete um, to that same standard. And so uh, all of it was gone, basically, Overnight in January first, two thousand eighteen, when the rule came in. Wow! And it took me no and no more than one hour to go. Okay, well I'm done. I'm done. I'm yeah. happy. Yeah. And I'm going to move on. Yeah, I mean that's the only way that you can deal with change in life. Is to accept it. It's just it always it. happens. Right? It always happens. That's yeah. it. Yeah. But how 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 did you do that? Like, did you have a great team of support around you? Because we would have also been so like like. It could have been hard because not everyone knows the politics of sport. So here you are at Rio being labelled as the next or the best thing. Like, people would have expected you to be an athlete for forever, right? Of course. I mean, friends, family. Yeah. And so how do you, you have that through pressure. that as that, that nah. pressure of expectation? Nah. Well, the only Just, expectation you have is the expectations that come from within yourself. Yeah. And the only judgment that ever matters in your life is the final one you give yourself before you die. And so I think holding to those two principles, it's like, I don't really care what other people think about what I should do. I could see how it was going to play out under the new rule changes and what a waste of time the next four years would be for everyone involved. So... And then on top of that, most people don't realise, I mean, don't get me wrong, um, doing things like going to the Paralympics and becoming an athlete presents itself with a lot of opportunities. Yep. But over the long run, athletes don't earn that much. Yep. You sacrifice a lot in terms of a social life. It has a certain impact on those around you because you can't do normal things. Yep. You can't even go on holidays, and so it was. I mean, it was. It was just. It was a pretty easy decision to make, to be honest. Yeah, and to to kind of reinvent yourself quite quickly, because one day you're a Paralympian, and the next day you you know you have that offers down the bottom of Queen Street. You know, that's the good thing about being a uh, you know a human being, um, is 
just as a species, we can adapt to pretty much anything. Yeah. I mean, w- uh, yeah, I, I just, I was never being convinced that you can only do one thing. You're never going to be good at anything, and whenever you start something new, it's going to be a really tough process to get good at it. But I don't As think, you're experiencing now. As, I, as I'm experiencing now, but it's just, it's, it's worth doing if the road is ending and you can see the road ending. You've got to get on a new road. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so, and yeah. there's something beautifully rewarding in that. Like, there's turn. something very stimulating about setting goals and achieving them. And initially, when you start something out, it's kind of bumpy. So, any small win that you get is like a massive win. I remember the first few times I dropped time as a runner was way more important than later on down the line. Yeah. You know, just being able to see that initial progress and that, I guess. Um, yeah, well, the the initial progress in, in moving forward is just yeah. is always incredible. Yeah, and you mentioned of those like those skills, kind of universal skills that you learned from running. Sure. That you've been able to adapt into whatever you do now. Sure. What, what other what were what, what kind of the main the main takeaways that you believe were universal? Yeah, sure. So I think even just for example when it comes to a probability of success. I mean, pick a sport that you're going to win. Yeah. You know, if you're a guy like me, you're not going to go and win shot put or fighting or anything like that, right? So, you know, bet on yourself at what you might be good at is a good start. Mm. Same thing applies for a job or any career move that you might want to make. Then team. Team is just so fundamentally important. Building a really strong team around you. And having a coach, not just a mentor, but someone like James, yep, who's a coach, right? Who can direct you, and in a, a, I mean, a mentor sort of provides uh, holistic advice. And Morty did that as well, but yep. a coach gives you really specific tasks to practice on. Getting yep. a coach is important. And how do you go? Like, if you found someone, you're like, yep, that's who I want to work with. How how do you go about approaching them and convincing them to be? part of your team yeah it's a real really good question on how you can convince that person that you add value to their life right and 99 percent of the time you might get a no which is you know that should be a starting point of expectation um but i think if you have something worthy that's uh, aspiring to do then you're selling them on a story and being a part of that journey within that story so I think learning how to sell your story to people, whether it's to a coach, a mentor, a sponsor, the public, yep. whoever, learning how to sell your story is really fundamental in that. I mean, for the first two years of my training, I trained by myself. I had a coach down in Nelson who wrote me programs, but I trained by myself. And it was a really bad move. I was lucky to be able to get hooked up with Marty, uh, Morty. Sorry. Um, Marty. And did you just see Morty run somewhere? Or no, how? he. Uh, my previous coach reached out to James, knowing how good James was, okay. and made that connection. And that's another thing is you know connecting with people and yeah. building a network. So that's you know one aspect of it. And then social incentives was something that I learned from sport. So you know who you surround yourself with and how they influence you socially is going to dictate your behavior. And if you can really build a network where your social incentives are really positive and really strong, you're going to do the right thing almost uncon- like unconscious, in an unconscious state. So you don't have to battle against yourself um, <coughs> to, to, to do the right thing. This even takes something like dieting. If you surround yourselves with people who eat popcorn and chocolate all day, yep. you're going to eat popcorn and chocolate. <laughs> totally. Yeah. If you're going to totally. hang around with you know, a bunch of people who do CrossFit and intermittent fasting or jiu-jitsu or whatever, you're going to do the same things as those people. And that, and that becomes your life, and you become a reflection exactly. of it. Exactly. But with that, you you had rapid, quite rapid success. I mean, despite you've been how you are for your whole life, like in terms of deciding to be a Paralympian, getting there, rapid success. How do you manage that? Like, because there would have been media, there would have been like booming. Um, like social media, like your your head and your your ego could have got out of control. Could have. Well, yeah. I've never taken myself seriously for a start. And there were a lot of weird side effects from it. So positive and negative. Positive, great things happening, got sponsored by Nike. Yep. That was a dream come true. Negative effects, I had people with, you know, amputee fetishes 
bombard me with emails and messages on social media. Basic thing. It's a, it's a weird thing, and it's a thing. And, uh, you know, sending me messages offering me $50 to take a photo of my leg and send it to them, which was disgusting. Just go for stump. Yeah, and which is disgusting. I mean, I was at least worth 100 Yeah, yeah. You know, effort, 50 yeah, Come yeah. on. And so... <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so there were tons of things that were... Yeah, but at the end of the day, it was all just fun for me, you know, yeah. and I was able to enjoy it. I was never concerned about how people might perceive me. On the in the media, I just was myself. I goofed around, and I mean, I went to the Paralympics looking like sideshow Bob. The most yeah, but he do was unreal, man. Disgusting, disgusting. But I mean, was that strategic though? Because God, it no, I thought got, they had a it barber got there. Attention. No, they got said, attention, well, no, they said that they had a barber in the Paralympic Village, <laughs> and I got there, and this is you've got you know ten thousand people in the village. They had one barber. Okay. I arrived three days after the village opened, so I couldn't get in to get a haircut. So I looked like Sideshow Bob. <laughs> you did, but it stood out and it became memorable. <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> and and it really, you know, like one of the things was how charisma, you know, like your, your charisma, like how charismatic you were, how approachable you were, and your communication and how that's now transferred into your speaking. Is that something that you've just, you think in having a disability that it's helped you develop your, the way in which you communicate? Because people make assumptions and you want to be like, no, this is who I am. I, probably less so. I think it's probably more genetic. So I think yep. it's probably more to do with personality traits like extroversion. I mean, I know tons of people with disabilities and who don't have disabilities who are shy and who are really extroverted and totally. great orators and great communicators. I know those that aren't, and it's not related to disability. So I think if I look back in my family tree, a lot of politicians. Grandfather was a great orator. He was a mayor of Nelson. And I have had the great misfortune of speaking at a lot of funerals when I was younger. Yeah. I dominated school speeches when I was younger. I think that is probably something that I'm good at. Yeah. Or I have the talent to be good at if I work hard at it. Yeah. And so when it came to communicating and, for lack of a better word, being charismatic at the games, I was really just being myself. I didn't really have to go in. I wasn't thinking about saying something silly. I just I say silly things all the time. You know, my my dad's always hated that because he's a real straight guy. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I just I never went in trying to be someone that I'm not. And it's resulted in what you do now as a speaker. It could have resulted in something even better if I was different. Yeah. Perhaps. You never know. But it is interesting, that kind of question that people have of, would you be doing this if you weren't? Would you, like, people love boxing and creating categories for people, you know? Of course. And there's people who will look at you at a work style. There's people who look at you who go, like, I speak at some schools and kids will be like, I think I'm alone. I love that guy. Do you do you get people who still put you in that box of adversity? Like, oh, you're the you're the guy with like a double with your game of your tea, who maybe yeah, goes, of oh, course. bless you or like but that's weird, eh? It is weird, but we are primed as you know, apes to put people into categories to be able to recognise them and remember them and so I don't think that's something that's socially constructed I think it's just how we operate as human beings do you think it's changing though or could change oh I mean I think I'm you're seeing a rise in it within identity politics and things and with our social fabric and people identifying themselves into groups and it's like now we're at a point and this is back to what I was speaking about earlier is we're now we're almost in a full-blown victim olympics state within society where people are moaning about what they've had, you know, mm. happened to them. Yeah. And I'm just not interested. It's I'm, tiring I'm stuff, just, right? It's tiring stuff. I'm like, the natural world's not fair, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, you and I are so lucky to be alive. If you and I were born 200 years ago as babies, if you had cerebral palsy born as a baby and they saw my little tentacle legs, you know, yeah. as I came out, boom, you'd be in the pit and you'd be dead. Yeah. You know? There's never been a better time to be alive. And so people want to put me in some sort of box. Ah. I don't know. That's cool. I, I, I believe I, they're limiting yeah. their own perspective of the world. People who do that. Like well, the most successful people I've met in this world tend not to do that. 
I would agree with you. But, yeah. but there's people who will really reach a level of success, perceived success, who still do that. When I talk about success, I mean like absolutely exceeding expectations. And, and it's people who are that opportunity centric. You know, just see yeah, what absolutely. you can do, look for the positive. And of course, I mean, that again is partly genetic, right? I mean, people are optimists and people are pessimists. And yeah. a lot of that is outside of their. Control, but I think there's a lot of things that you can do. So I think you know meditation and the practice of mindfulness will help you. You focus on more positive things, and you can at least be observant when you're being negative about the world and what you are capable of. And so I think there's room for people to make change to themselves if they want to. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that optimism. You, I remember a story of your dad saying, "Son, we'll be big. You'll be with technology." you'll be able to run faster than all your friends when you just lost the school cross country. Was your dad a, an innovative kind of guy? Or? He's not innovative, but he is... I don't know how to describe my dad, actually, but he is... He was very optimistic when I was younger, and out of all the parents, he seemed to always put it, put, like, yell at me these sort of principles about being organised, about being disciplined, about hard work gets makes people successful, that yeah. people make their own luck. And he also, in regards to what you just said about, you know, when I was growing up, my legs were still made of wood. And he told me not to worry about it because one day someone would build me legs that would allow me to run all my friends. And I would go and say that at school and I'd get laughed at, right? And then it happened. Yeah. He also taught me that the future is going to be better. And you need to put yourself in a, in a position where you can benefit from the positive outcomes that occur in the future because there's going to be a lot of them. And so that was something that was, I guess, an overriding aspect to my optimism about what the future might look like. And of course, you go through ups and downs, but if you can put yourself with the right people at the right time, you're going to get lucky. Really lucky. And have a life that is now seeing you traveling all over the world. You've just got back to London. You've, you, you, you've got this ability to... To really create whoever you want to be as Liam Malone and Sure, world. but it's still really hard. It is hard. Yeah, and there's no guarantee that I'll ever have the success that I had at the Paralympics again. And that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. But that's also a perspective thing. And uh, of the way I see it is you're out there, you've got that hustle, you've got that desire, and now it's kind of trusting the process, right? Yeah, and that's, like what, that's having, what I do love. It's having the balls to be able to pack up from Auckland, from the life, and go, actually, I'm going to go to London and just see what happens. Yeah, I mean, that's not that hard for me. I've always, I am not someone who's risk averse. I mean, so I, you know, when I got my skydive license, the first time I ever tried to race downhill mountain biking, I'd never even been on a downhill mountain bike track. I was like 12 or 13. I entered myself into the Oceania championships right so New Zealand Australia and the Pacific I got to this downhill course I had totally defied what I expected I think the average time to get to the bottom took four minutes it took me 24 I got to the bottom with dislocated fingers and a snapped leg and that's always the way that I've approached things is like take on the hardest thing first and figure out what it is actually going to take to get good at it Instead yep. of the smaller approach to things of putting, you know, testing the waters. I don't, I don't like yeah. testing the waters. Just mm. jump right in. Make it happen. And for jumping right in, I've just got a few, like, quick fire questions to end the, end the interview with or end the conversation. Uh, first one, the word normal. What, what does it bring to you? What do you Nothing. Think? I don't care about the word normal. Um, the, I mean, the world is so crazy and chaotic and so is the universe and the cosmos we're a bunch of slightly intelligent chimps monkeys on earth this floating spaceship you know nothing i don't really look at anything as being normal per se nothing would nothing would surprise me put it that way perfect what you got given a hundred bucks what would you do with it buy bitcoin no um that's a joke could you still buy it for 100 bucks yeah, I mean, you could buy a percentage a of, of one, one Satoshi or something. Uh, no, I would invest it in some sort of exchange-traded fund, probably the US 500. Yeah, and that's the thing, right? No investment is too small. No investment is too small. Invest, you know, 10% or 20% of every paycheck. 
Awesome. Yeah. The word awesome. What does that mean to you? Oh, just a way to live life, I think. There are just certain ways that you can live life that are better. And uh, if you can live an awesome life, that's certainly one that's better. And I think it's a principle in of itself. I think people know what awesome means to them. And uh, that's how I try to live live, live by things. Yeah. Awesome. And you've given us heaps of advice and quotes. And, but what's the best advice that you've been given? And there's loads of it, but what just comes to mind? No one else knows what they're doing either. Or uh, if you don't want that one, if you want to do anything that is exceptional, by definition, you're going to be unqualified. So I think at the current way that the world exists, everyone's trying to get qualified before they take on the task. Yep. Just take on the task first, and eventually you'll become qualified. Yeah. So, Sh- shoot me name. Yeah. And what excites you most, and why? Oh, that is a good question. Um, hmm. I'd like to finish on a banger. Yeah, I don't actually know what excites me most. Generally speaking, if I can paint with a broad brush, the future. Um, it would be that simple. Just I think we're going to live better lives. A lot of diseases are going to be solved. The world's going to become a better place. And with that, we'll present a ton of wonderful opportunities. Awesome. Thank you very much, Cap. I love it. Liam Malone, thanks so much for coming on, showing us dream big achievement and what it takes to live an awesome life. You're the dude. Thank you so much. Thanks, Cam. Wow, what a privilege it was to have this guy, Liam Malone, in the studio, talking about and sharing moments from his life. And you know what? I asked some questions that weren't necessarily my own belief, but I knew they could be common beliefs. What I loved about asking them is how Liam egos what I feel and believe when it comes to difference, opportunity, inequality, resilience, normality, enhancing oneself. And there's a few things we can really reflect on. So, let's reflect on our progress. Where have we been? Where are we now? Where are we going? Who's in our team? Who can we approach to be in that team? And remember what it is that we can offer that person so that they see you. Who's our coach or coaches in life? And in a similar way to our team, we've got to offer them something. Much in the way that Liam did to his athletics coach, James Mortimer. Liam learned skills on the track and in building his track brand that he continues to use now as a speaker, comedian, entertainer, and all-round achiever. So, how do we sell ourselves? What do we sell to people? Not just when we talk, but when we walk. Are we projecting who we want to be and are all of the time? Are we projecting ourselves based on our challenges? Or are we projecting ourselves based on our ambition? What I talk is the most important as we head into the rest of our days, weeks, months, years, lives. It's quite simple. Do what we're good at. Invest in finding that thing challenge ourselves, go out there, try what's new, what's different, strive towards our most desired success and aim to become as awesome as we can be. So thank you Liam Malone for sharing your awesomeness. Thank you to the NBR, the National Business Review for making this recording with Liam possible. The team that make this possible don't do it for any other reason than they want to share a good message and inspire me. So finally, thanks to you, the listener, for creating that audience. A bit like Liam said, we've just got to go out sometimes and give things a go. And through giving them a go, we will get better. So dream big, achieve more, and enjoy your awesomeness.